Sunday. I'm a member of the uh, Candy Assembly team uh, organizers. And uh, I, I do want to say that the, the group has been very uh, overwhelmed by the response to last year's show. And uh, everyone supported this year's show, from the exhibitors to the speakers to uh, the attendees. Uh, to the sponsors, and we appreciate everyone who has helped support this show. I want to thank you all very much for coming. Uh, we are very honored uh, to have a special a keynote speaker here. He has a long and distinguished career in the technology field, and uh, I'm going to just briefly run through. Uh, he has been called, Stuart Chaffee has been called the original TV techie and the Dean of Television Computer Journalists. He pioneered the field over 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, with his show, The Computer Chronicles, which I'm sure many of you know and uh, are familiar with. I remember watching that show back in the 80s and, and just loving the fact that there was a show about computers at that time. And always hoping that he would talk about my computer on the show that, you know, that week, but, um, it was a great show. He served as host and managing editor of Computer Chronicles. He anchored another public television show dedicated to the internet called Internet Ca or Net Cafe. Both series were broadcast nationally and throughout the world in over 100 countries for 20 years. His programs are still popular online, regularly downloaded, and viewed by fans all around the world. Stewart has been a guest commentator on National Public Radio's All Things Considered, has hosted a weekly web radio talk show called Talking About This Week. He wrote and co-anchored a syndicated radio series about the internet called Cyber Traffic Report. He's won numerous awards for his broadcast journalism work, including a CPA Award for Best Individual Technology Television Program of the Year, he was named by Adweek Magazine as one of the five most influential broadcast journalists in the field of technology. He's written for publications such as Windows Magazine, PC Magazine, Silicon Valley Magazine, The Prize Magazine, and Digital Video Magazine. And he also published this Chaffee newsletter, which is a monthly in psychology. He also holds a doctorate in law from Harvard and was a Benton Fellow in technology journalism at the University of Chicago. Stuart will talk about his early experiences with Radio Shack computers, He'll talk about Computer Chronicles, of course, and an update on what he's done since the show. We're very honored to have all of you to come to our show, which celebrates the contributions that Tandy Radio Shack made to the computer and technology field. And we're very honored to have Stuart Chaffe here to help us kick it off. Thank you very much, Mandy. Can you guys hear? Yeah. We have a Mickey Mouse audio system here. We couldn't figure out how to get audio out of the laptop, so we got a mic next to the speaker. <laughs> and we heard only the last couple of seconds of what was the opening theme to Computer Chronicles. But I'm going to start with actually playing a clip of a show we did, many of you may have seen. It was devoted completely to Tandy and Radio Shop Computers back in 1991, so over 25 years ago. So let's take a look. And when your radio broke down, you would take one of these out of the back, take it down to a store like this called Radio Shack, test it, find it, <laughs> and probably buy some other electronic junk while you were here. <laughs> no kids are just as likely to walk out of a Radio Shack store carrying computer software or a brand new 386 PC. For from the Model 1 to the Model 100, from the color computer to the new multimedia PCs, Tandy Radio Shack has played a significant role in the growth of personal computers. Today, we take a look at Tandy computers then and now on the special edition of the Computer Chronicles. <coughs> so again, this is a show from 1991. And I was a big Tandy fan, so were a lot of people who worked on the show. So we decided why not do a whole half hour just on Tandy computers. Computer Chronicles is made possible. 
So we had sponsors called underwriters in the public television world, and at that time they kept on changing these to some of the ads we ran prior to the beginning of the show. I'm going to run this first couple of seconds of the actual show itself. Visit to the Color Computer Users Group in Santa Clara, California. 
the, the Radio Shack color. All right, we don't have time for all of that, but you want to see the whole show, it's online. It's called Tandy Slash Radio Shack. <laughs> so, let's move ahead. Can you guys hear me okay, by the way? <clears throat> so what I want to do is talk a little bit, really, about Computer Chronicles, my experience playing with all these old computers for going back about 30 years ago, I guess, when we all started. And kind of answer some of the questions that people always ask me about the Computer Chronicles show, how it got started, and so on. Uh, I want to mention the other show we did for six years called Net Cafe, which was a lot of fun, all focused on the internet. And I'll talk about some of the memorable moments I remember from doing Computer Chronicles in the studio. Uh, I want to talk about how we got Computer Chronicles online on the archive, the internet archive, which is an interesting story. Some of the interesting people I met during the time we did Computer Chronicles. People ask me about why is there no more Computer Chronicles, so I'll talk about the demise of the show, and just a little bit about more than what's now. So how did this all start? Well, it was a very selfish endeavor, actually. I was a geek. I just bought my Model 1 from TRS-80. And there was very little support available at the time, as you know. There were virtually there were two computer magazines, I think, at the time, very high-end, not really for, for dumb users like me. And uh, I was looking at a way to get some more information <coughs> on how to use my computer and how to do cool things with it. Besides having my Tandy computer, I was basically a gadget geek at the time. I, and to this day, I still have what? I have three Amiga computers, a bunch of PCs, a bunch of Apples. I had a complete list of all the PDAs that ever came out. Uh, I was a big fan of techie watches. I have a whole collection of watches that are uh, high tech. I have the original laptop, which many people may not remember, was the HP Portable, which I have and it still works. Uh, one of my prized possessions is the first optical encyclopedia that came out from Activision and then Activenture, the Grolier's Encyclopedia on a laser disc. Mm -hmm. I didn't have enough room to fit it on the LCDs. Uh, I still have that, I'm very proud of it. My favorite floppy piece of antique stuff is the original five and quarter inch Apple disc of Visicalc. Wow. So a lot of great old stuff, and I love that old stuff. So the problem is, how did you get help in those early days to figure out what you were doing with all these computers? So the basic place you went to for help was a user's group. So I went to a users group meeting in the Bay Area. I was working in the Silicon Valley area at the time. And I was fascinated by what happened at this users group meeting. I mean, it was really good, solid information that you really couldn't get anywhere else. So there were like 12 guys in some guy's garage. I said, this is such a waste of information. There should be thousands, tens of thousands of people being able to participate in this users group meeting, not just 12 guys in the garage. At the time, I was running a TV station, a PBS TV station in the Silicon Valley, and I thought, I want to make a TV show out of this. <clears throat> Let's televise these user group meetings so more people can benefit from them. And that's really how it got started. We started out with doing a, believe it or not, a live show <coughs> demonstrating new technology, which didn't work half the time. We're very brave. <laughs> live show Thursday nights, 8 to 9, in the Silicon Valley area. And it was hosted the first year. I didn't host it, I produced it. The host was Jim Warren, who had had back to the first computer trade show, the West Coast Computer Fair. And basically, he'd come in the studio, invite his geek friends, and they would say, here's this new toy, here's this new thing I did. And I thought this was just sort of a community television, sort of a fun little thing we were doing. And some, for some reason, it took off. People started to discover there was this show called Computer Chronicle. Again, just local, very low production value, no budget, everybody worked for nothing. And somehow, it caught on. We decided, since it seemed so popular, that we would do something about this and try to make a better show with more production values in time for a new show starting in the next season. Unfortunately, Jim Warren wasn't able to come onto the show because he was pretty busy doing other stuff. And he really wasn't that great, frankly, a television host. He was, he was great for the super geek community, but normal people couldn't really understand what he was talking about. So we said, let's try to not only build the show up, but make it a little bit more approachable for new users. And for some reason, the staff came to me and said, Stu, why don't you host it? Because I actually had been working as a reporter for the Nightly Business Report covering Silicon Valley. I had worked in, my background was ABC News and CBS News, so anyhow, I ended up saying yes to do it. Problem was, we had to find the money to do the show. Again, we couldn't afford it. If we were going to do a high-quality show that has syndication possibilities, we couldn't do it you know, on a dime the way we were doing it before. So we started looking around, who, who could we find to sponsor this show? Well, there was this company down the road called Apple, and they just came out with the Apple II, and I thought, these guys are looking for customers, we're looking for a sponsor. 
So some of the people working with me contact some of the people at Apple and say, we have a great idea for you. Why don't you sponsor this new show called The Future Chronicles? And we met with the staff at Apple, their marketing people, their advertising people, their PR people. They all thought it was a great idea. They said, we're going to recommend this to Steve. Steve Jones, of course. Uh, and see if we can, uh, we'll go ahead. So I actually wrote a memo to Steve saying, we recommend that Apple sponsor this new show called The Future Chronicles. So I was invited to make a presentation to the Apple board meeting with Steve Sharing <clears throat> to give my final pitch as to why they should sponsor the show. Well, that was my first unpleasant experience with Steve Jobs. <laughs> <laughs> first of many. <laughs> so on my turn on the agenda to make the presentation, I think I had four words came out of my mouth and interrupted me, which was his style. He said, let me ask you a question. Said, sure. Are you going to cover non-Apple products on your show? I said, sure. I said, it's a computer show. It's not an Apple show. You need a sponsor. Well, why the hell should I give you money to promote my competitors? I said, well, when you, my guess is when you take an ad in a magazine or a newspaper, you don't tell the editorial side, they're not allowed to do anything except cover Apple products. As we signed up, I think they wasted the money. <laughs> so he sat there like this, and he doing this, let me think. I have a better way to spend that money. Let's spend it on, I got an idea, a Super Bowl commercial. That was the genesis of the famous 1984 Macintosh commercial. Wow. So I made the pitch, but CBS got the money. <laughs> <laughs> a quarter million dollars. Anyhow, that was not a good experience. <laughs> so we ran out of luck with Apple and we decided to go somewhere else. Well, luckily we found the complete opposite of Steve Jobs, a guy named Gary Kildall. Total gentleman, really cared about what we were doing, really cared about educating the public about personal, personal computer technology. And we talked to Gary, and he said, why don't you come up, see me, we'll talk about this, see if we can help. Unfortunately, Digital Research, the company he was running, was 100 miles away from our studio, which is in San Mateo, California. Gary said, don't worry about it, I'm going to send my chopper down, we'll pick you guys up, we'll meet at the San Carlos Airport, we'll fly you over here, we'll have our meeting, we'll fly you back. Wow, what do you guys do? Complete opposite from my previous experience. Um, so he said, uh, our chopper pilot will meet you at 2 o'clock at the cafeteria at the San Carlos Airport. <clears throat> so a colleague of mine was standing there in the cafeteria at the San Carlos Airport. It's time at 2 o'clock. Can't see any chopper pilot. We're looking, we're waiting. We have made a mistake, something's wrong here, so we called Gary's office. I said, I don't, I don't see the pilot. Where is he? It says, she. Oh. <laughs> My first lesson in sexism. I assumed the chopper pilot was gone. <laughs> and it was this very capable woman who was the chopper pilot. He goes, I'm, you're, I'm, you're the guys I'm waiting for. Anyhow, they flew us out to see Gary and met me, and he couldn't have been nicer. He said, look, I can't afford to give you all the money. You're looking for a quarter million dollars. But I will give you some seed money to help you find the money. And I'll give you 25,000 bucks to help you find what you need to sponsor the show. And I saw when I met Gary how articulate he was and how smart he was and how nice he was. And he said, Gary, you know, I'm actually looking for a co-host on the show. I'm just a journalist. I'm not really a tech. You're the techie guy. If we could co-host this together, that would be a great combination. I'll do it. He was running a very big, successful company at the time called Digital Research. He agreed to do two full days a month to come, to come down to the Silicon Valley and <coughs> co-host the show with me. This was actually fun because Gary, as you may know, was a pilot. So he would have to fly down. Gary also had a lot of money in his car, but he would drive down in his Lamborghini. It's a quarter million dollar Lamborghini. That was all looking for my show. Yeah, that <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, he volunteered to do it, and what a great decision that was. And we started with the 25000 that Gary gave us. We actually were able to find a real sponsor. Our first sponsor of the show was a company called Microfocus, an English company that had just done an IPO, had a lot of cash sitting around. Nobody had ever heard of them in the United States. And their bit was, uh, transcoding COBOL programming for a personal computer. Anyhow, it worked out, and so with the money, money we launched our new show, a half hour show, uh, <clears throat> and which much, with much better production value. Now, this was again started as a local show. We knew nothing about syndicating the show. We were just following our passion. So there was no internet, no cell phones, there was nothing. It was bulletin boards. <laughs> Somehow these guys on the BBS have started talking to each other around the country. This man shows in Silicon Valley, he explains all this computer stuff. So the geeks started calling their local PBS station saying, why don't you carry your show? Manager of the station started calling me, saying, how can we get your show? Just by answering the phone, 
Three months later, we were on the 20 cities around the country. This was viral before anybody used the word viral. Oh, this wow. gone viral. It just took off totally on its own. We never tried to sell it. It sold itself. And again, at the end of one year, we were on about 100 cities. At the end of two years, 200 cities. At the end of three years, we had international distribution. There was a French version, a Spanish version, an Arabic version. We were on over 100 countries around the world with our little computer terminal. It started out with 100. And then it just wouldn't die. <laughs> <laughs> 20 years I kept on doing this. <laughs> I mean, this is a job, you know. I mean, I had a full time day job running a TV station. So this was really just a, a hobby of love for me. Never got paid anything to do computer conference, by the way. I just did it for fun. And unfortunately, about six or seven years later, Gary decided to move digital research from the Silicon Valley to Austin, Texas. Competition for talent at the time in the Valley was really tough. Prices were really hard for town. Prices, the cost of living was really high. Yeah, of course, digital research was not the digital research that did six years ago. Gary decided to move to Austin, where it would be less expensive to run his company. And so we lost Gary as a co host. We tried rotating co hosts. I mean, I worked with different people, and it just turned out to be a mess. I had to keep on training people every other week about how to do the show. Finally, the staff came to me and said, Why don't you just do it yourself? You know how to so I said, OK, I'll just it myself. Can you imagine what fun? If you're a geek like I was, loving all the new toys, all the new stuff that came out, have a job where you got to see it before anybody else saw it. And it was really, really like to explain it to other people. I mean, this was not a job. This was just great fun. And as a matter of fact, there was a little anecdote I should share with you. We had, a, I think it was our first producer on the show. And we had trouble keeping people because the salaries were so high in Silicon Valley. We were a little non-profit. So she was being recruited by some uh, high-tech PR firm in the Valley. They were offering to double her salary. And the interviewer said to her, why would you consider leaving that show? What's so great about working on the Peter Chronicle? She says, because every day is like Christmas morning. I come to the office and there are boxes at the front door with all these new gadgets, all these new toys, and then we get to play with them, and we get to see them before anybody else does. And that was the story of why everybody was in love with the show, at least the people who worked on it. Let me move over a little bit to the Net Cafe show, which never was as popular as Computer Chronicles, but it was interesting. I had the same experience. <clears throat> so I remember to start Chronicles, I went to this users group meeting, decided there should be more than 20 people watching this thing. Let's make a television show. At that time, about mid 1990s, there were these things called cyber cafes or internet cafes starting. One of the big ones originally was something called Cybersmith. They opened a new store in Cambridge, Massachusetts, near Harvard. They opened a store in Palo Alto, near Stanford. And I used to hang out at the uh, cyber cafe at Stanford in Palo Alto. And this was the same experience I had all over again with Chronicles. This was great stuff. People were really explaining the new websites and how to do stuff and how to stream and so on and so forth. This ought to be a television show. And I said, let's do it. So the next year we started this new show called Net Cafe. The same idea, except it was different. Chronicles were shot in the studio. We decided to get the real Net Cafe experience. <coughs> And we decided to shoot it in Internet Cafe Zone around basically the Bay Area. We did some back east. And it was really all the key guys were coming up with new ideas, new internet cool things. We would sit around and talk. This was not about technology, we didn't do demos, but we really talked about the people and the culture of this new thing called the internet. And I had great fun doing that show. Um, we got involved back in the community, we were aware of the Webby Awards, which was sort of the Academy Awards and the websites. And I think for several years, we produced a one-hour special each year uh, covering the Webby Awards. There was one show in particular. I think it was the very first show. The, guess what? The award for best new search engine went to a company called Google. <laughs> well, Sergey and Larry, the two guys who founded Google, were there to accept the award. You may know these two guys are Russians. And the big ice hockey fans there. They were prepared to win. They call it, the winners are Sergey Grin and Larry Page with Google. These guys rollerbladed down the aisle <laughs> with their hockey sticks. Some of them managed to climb up on the stage on their skates, roll to the podium, give, give their acceptance speech on rollerblades. Uh, a pretty, pretty fun moment. Uh, while talking about the internet, I should mention one other thing, by the way, that most people don't know. The very first television program, full television program, half hour television program, streamed on the internet, was Computer Chronicles. And that was Computer Chronicles. Back in, I think it was 1992. M bone at the time, developed by a guy in Washington, D.C. So we were really excited to actually put a TV show on the web. <clears throat> I want to talk about 
things I remember about some of the shows you did. At the time, I was working with a dot matrix printer, and Xerox announced they'd come out with a color laser printer. Wow. Now, there were laser printers out at the time, and they were very expensive, very few individual users could afford to use a laser printer. <coughs> These guys had a color laser printer, so we're going to put that on the show. We'll be doing a show on printers and hard copy. So we invited Xerox to come into the studio and demonstrate the new color laser printer. The printer, I thought, was a little thing you put on your desk. And this thing was the size of a Volkswagen. <laughs> a big Volkswagen, not a big one. <laughs> Came on two pallets, three engineers, to install this thing, set it up, and get it working. And it took them forget, I think it, I don't know how long it took these guys to do this. And at some point they finally said, okay, we're ready to try it. So everything was plugged in again. It was a monster thing took up half the studio. And they give it, say, this is the print button, I'm gonna press the print button. I press the print button, smoke sucks. Oh really <laughs> <laughs> great smoke. Okay, hold it, hold on. I think we made a mistake. I guess so. <laughs> give us another half hour. <laughs> Twiddle it around, twiddle it around, twiddle it around. And say, okay, we're ready to try it again. <laughs> Presses the print button, and the most gorgeous piece of output I've ever seen in my life came out of this printer. There's a famous picture you may have seen, there's a picture of a baboon, the face of a baboon. Oh, yeah. Brilliant resolution, brilliant color, I still have that out there. And I said, wow, this is the future of output, this is spectacular. So we finally made it through the disaster in Xerox, and we came up with a really good demo. Another interesting, we used to do something at the beginning of most shows called, called the toy piece. We played something really simple get across the idea of what we were talking about. So we were going to do a show on robots and robotics. And as we were researching the show, we found somebody who developed a ping pong robot, a robot that could play ping pong. Cool, I mean, it didn't play itself, it played a human player. It had a human on one side, a robot on the other side. <laughs> so we were going to open the show with this robot ping pong player playing the human ping pong. I said to Gary, look, I'm not a really good ping pong player, you're better than I am, why don't you get a woman? Sure. So they wired the whole thing up, let's give it a test, and we're going to have to tape. And he said, do you want Gary, do you want to serve, or do you want the robot to serve? And so what did the robot serve? <laughs> he presses the button, the robot strives this missile right to Gary's crotch. What a brave Gary said, I'll do it again, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> we finally got it to work, but that was a very embarrassing moment on the show. <laughs> Lots of embarrassing moments, I'll give you another one. So we were showing off the new IBM PS2, we had John Gora come to the studio and demonstrate the PS2. It was a modular computer. It was like a computer made out of a Lego set. So you didn't have to have soldering irons, you didn't have to have wires anywhere. You just pull these Lego blocks out. He said, let me show you. This thing is so good, so simple, so modular. You can take it apart, put it back together right here. You have any tools. Let's do it. He pulls all the modules out. He starts to so let's put it back together now, John. Puts that module in, puts that module in, and picks it. Where did that go? Is that that side? That's not been shown before. Then we had a sophomore example. We had Peter Norton on the show. Peter Norton Utilities famous. And his claim to fame was his original program called On a Race. And he astonished people by saying, you know, when you think you delete a file, you don't really delete it, you just delete the address. And I'm going to show you how to bring back a file you thought you were deleting. So let me show you how to do this. So he took this file, and he said, I'm going to delete this file. Watch, delete, gone. Now I'm going to bring it back. Watch this. <laughs> Sweat coming down his back. Can't find it. I know it's here somewhere. I believe me, I can do it. <laughs> Stop tape. Wait till he figures it in. Pick up the end, and he was able to do it. <laughs> Can't imagine how I found was not a but something that was spoken by a guy We were doing a show on OS2 before. And at the time, there was sort of a competition between Windows and the and OS2 as to what was going to be the high end operating system in the future. And <coughs> there was supposedly a partnership between Microsoft and IBM and OS2. As is Microsoft's style, under the table, they were threatening to kill OS2. But that was not the public position. Here's this guy from Microsoft on the show. So look, solutions on OS2. This is spoken by a guy from Microsoft. Very telling as to what goes on at the top and what goes on inside. I was a big fan and always have been, of course, the world was changing dramatically on speech synthesis and speech recognition. So we did a show on speech synthesis and speech recognition. And the first real product that utilized this technology was a doll from Mattel. The talking doll that came out from Mattel. And with this doll, you could press a button and say, hello, doll, how are you? Doll say, I'm fine, how are you? What's your name? My name is Doll, whatever. So we went to a Toys R Us right before Christmas, and the entire aisle was full of these new talking dolls from Mattel. All right, let's do the demo. So we 
rolling tape, and I'm pushing my feet. Now watch how this feels in here. I press the try me, and I say to the doll, hi, my name is Stuart, how are you? The doll says, oh, I'm fine, how are you? Don next door says, I'm fine, how are you? Don next door says, I'm fine, how are you? A hundred dollars start pumping. Never thought of this problem. <laughs> Very proud of the fact that we not only cover technology in this country, but we run around the world. I think we shop in a dozen different countries. Uh, I think we're in France, Spain, Hong Kong, Israel, Germany. Monaco, Austria, Italy, Taiwan, Japan, Hungary, Czech Republic, and China. Let me tell you a story of trying to shoot in China. So when we travel to another country to do a show, we bring all our gear. And at the time, it was a separate videotape recorder. It wasn't built in the camera, it was a separate camera. And we would come with our box of blank videotapes. We were shooting on three-quarter inch pneumatic video cassettes at the time. So the box of about 30 cassettes I think, to do the show. So we're going through customs at the Beijing airport. The guy says, what's in that box? I said, blank videotapes. What do you mean blank videotapes? He said, well, they've never been used. You box them in the movie. What's on the tapes? I said, nothing. I've got to see the tapes. He said, we never use them. I've got to see the tapes to make sure there's no pornography, there's no anti-communist propaganda on there. <clears throat> For four hours, he was going to stare at the blank screen. <laughs> used up all our batteries. We actually went to go to work. We had to spend the entire night charging all our batteries again. Four hours of staring in the black screen. We'll never forget that one. <laughs> Very proud of a show we did back in 1991, 25 plus years ago, when nobody ever heard the term on virtual reality. <clears throat> this was a difficult show to do. Again, very new cutting edge technology, but we did a VR show. We had a lot of fun doing the computer wall shows. I don't know if you ever saw this, but we would actually produce a quiz show between the geeks from the West Coast, the geeks from the East Coast, the geeks from the West Coast, the geeks and number one, it got me to see how viciously competitive these guys are. <laughs> Especially Joe Gates, by the way. He, he would not, anything, anytime he didn't win, it was unfair. <laughs> Anyhow, so we worked with, uh, I worked with Gates several times, Andy Grove, and Staker, and Kirstel, and Ed Jude, the that was there, Mark Andreessen, Ben Joy, Jean Louis Gasset, uh, John Dorf, all the guys. It was great fun doing the show. It was really super smart guys who were viciously competitive. They did not like to lose. Big surprise, they were running the companies. Let me talk a little bit about that. As I finish talking about shows, let me ask you what you think is the most popular show you ever did in terms of the amount of downloads from America. What was the subject of that? The Commodore 64. <laughs> this is a loyal group of guys. The most popular show has been downloaded, downloaded, not viewed, downloaded over a quarter million times just from the archive let alone what's on YouTube. Who would think it's Commodore 64 guys, there is dedicated to that C64 you are to the Let me talk about how we got these shows all online, actually, because that's a pretty interesting story also. So by the mid-1990s, I guess, we had hundreds of shows on videotape sitting on the shelf. Keep in mind, over the years, the videotape formats have been changing. So we have three quarter inch, and one inch, and two inch, blah, blah, blah. And I still have all these tapes lined up all these different formats which most of which can be play anymore. So it so happens on the Net Cafe show we were doing, I was interviewing Bruce Kale, who started the Internet Archive. And the Internet Archive started out as really an archive of web pages. Bruce's very clever idea was if you do research, you can go to the library and look up an old magazine, you can go to the library and look up an old newspaper, but you can't go to the library and look up an old web page. They disappear. So Bruce decided, let's start a library of web pages so people can go back and research these things. He started a thing called the Wayback Machine. The Wayback Machine, you can actually put in the URL, uh, yahoo.com, 1987, and you can see it on the website. It was really a brilliant idea. But the archive at the time was focused on text, because that's pretty much what the internet was at that time. All of a sudden, there's a lot of audio and video now on the website, and you want to handle that. So I saw what his problem was, and I said, what well, do you think about my problem? I've got hundreds of television shows all about the video history of personal sitting on the shelf, inaccessible. Why don't we build a video collection in the Internet Archive of all our shows, digitize them, and make them freely accessible to anybody? I said, are you nuts? Give them away. I said, yeah, it's what Gary would have wanted us to do. And so we started a two-year project, mostly run by volunteers, to digitize all these tapes in all these different formats. You might be nightmare to find machines to run these tapes. And we built up this entire library and put the 
decided to put them online for free, downloadable for free, no advertising, no sponsors, no belonging, no registration, no subscribing. And that was a big move for us. I mean, this is a couple million dollars of intellectual property. But really, in honor of Gary, we said, this is the whole point of the show, let's be behind that. Now, we put those shows on under a Creative Commons license, which had restrictions on it. You could use it for non commercial purposes only. We trusted the tech community, falsely. People started stealing this stuff left and right. To this day, everything on YouTube is pirated. We have never created a YouTube site. It's all stolen stuff, put ads around it. I tried to fight it for a while after the year, it was a losing battle. No pill. We want people to watch it when watch it on YouTube. But it's been a very frustrating experience. This ended up being a great online searchable database of the video of the PC revolution. And what really fascinates me, and more people have watched the show online now than ever watched on television, I get an email every day from two different types of people. Older guys, 65 year old guys, oh, I remember the good old days, it's such fun watching these old shows. But better than that, I get emails from 15 year olds. This is so cool, I had no idea what the history of all this stuff was. So it really is. And the life just continues to go on as people discover this stuff. Let me talk a little bit about the uh, people we dealt with in the computer conference. <coughs> and the first guy I have to talk about again is Gary Kilmore. You may know the story, very, very sad story. Poor Gary died at age 52. Very sad ending to his life. He just could never get over the fact that he had screwed by Bill Gates. It drove him crazy. But Bill Gates became the hero. Nobody's ever heard of Gary Kilmore. Most people have never heard of Gary Kilmore really invented the personal computer business with this thing came out with. He just could never get used to that. He, his life really fell apart, started drinking, mm -hmm. drugs, lost his wife, gained weight. And believe it or not, Gary, the most gentle man you can imagine, was at a biker bar in Pacific Grove, was drunk probably, got into an argument with some guy, swung at him, knocked him down on the ground. It's tough to tell the story. Hit his head on the concrete, died three, years, three days later with a concussion. Incredible, incredibly sad story. Such a good man, such a good man. <clears throat> Let's talk about the IBM MS DOS CPM battle. As many of you know, the great news Gary on the flying with the IBM controlling. To some degree, that's true, but let me tell you what Gary told me about that. And there's lots of aspects of it. <coughs> but I was sitting with Gary one day and I said, Come, tell me the truth. What really happened when you did these IBM meetings? This told so much about who Gary was. Did you know they wanted to come on a Saturday? That was my wife's birthday. I had promised my wife I would take her flying. And I wasn't going to cancel that for something I could do. And this is the kind of Gary was. His loyalty to his wife was more important than doing it on the IBM. There's, again, there's many other aspects of the story. But this is the kind Gary was not a businessman. Gary was not one of these viciously competitive guys. He was a brain guy. He was an innovator, developer, coder. And that was an example of it. I think you know the story of what eventually happened with IBM and CPM and MS DOS. Gary was certainly not a businessman. And that was one of those great weaknesses. Great technology guy, but not a businessman. They eventually made a deal with IBM. And it was a compromise. IBM said, look, if you come out of a computer, we'll put CPM on there, but we also want to put MS DOS on there. And let the market decide which one Best. Gary said, no problem, we're going to win that battle. What Gary didn't know, which wasn't in the contract, was that IBM was going to charge $240 for CPM and $40 for MS DOS. Guess who won? <laughs> Six to one price difference. Gary got screwed, never got over that. I might say Bill Gates is certainly a tough, hard nosed businessman, but I've spent some time with Bill over the years. And I'm not like most guys, I don't think he's a jerk. Steve Jobs, jerk. Bill Gates, not a jerk. Uh, a really smart guy, no question about it. A tough business guy, no question about it. Absolutely wants to win. But a decent guy, a smart guy, a cooperative guy. Uh, always got along well with him. Uh, to everybody's surprise, I've never been a guy that doesn't Gates. Except, yeah, they sort of screwed Gary, but that was one of the mistakes on both sides in that negotiation. Bill Gates told me two brilliant things not to do with technology, but to do with managing a large company. Remember at the time, Microsoft owned the world. I mean, computers around the world, software, and Microsoft. Operating systems, applications, Microsoft, office, suite, et cetera. 
So I said to him, what are some of your basic rules of how you manage a monster company like this? He said, well, I have one basic rule. So I got tired of all the managers coming in to me for a meeting and telling me how great it is. Everything is great, there's no problem. Everything is great. And he said, this can't be the case. I made a rule. Every time somebody comes to me in a meeting and says some good news, the good news, you must give me a piece of bad news. That was brilliant this morning. Tell me what's bad. Don't just tell me what's good. Because what's bad needs my help. What's good doesn't need my help. What a creative mind to think about that. The other thing that amazed me with, Gary, with uh, Bill at the time, again, remember, this was a Microsoft world in, in the early 90s. Windows had taken off, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, uh, you know, what, are you, what are you worried about? So I wake up every morning worrying about what I didn't think of. Where are we going? Who's going to take us home? Of course, we hadn't thought about the network. You know. But he was smart enough to know he didn't know. And I just was very impressed with Bill and the guy. And look what he did with his life. He gave up the whole tech mess and spent his billions of dollars doing health care all around the world. He was really a good guy. We had George Morrow filled in, actually, after Gary left the show as a co-host for a while. George was a really bright guy, very clever guy. He came out and made a number of the pivot. One first luggable, actually, he was smaller than the Osborne and the compact. It was a luggable portable computer. And it's interesting for people who went to floppy disks. George was on the show, actually, as a, as a writer. And he showed me the pivot one, and he used five and a quarter inch floppy disks. Apple had just come out with three and a half inches. George very proudly said, everybody's stuff is on five and a quarter. Who wants to buy a computer that doesn't serve five, like five and a quarter? And he, he was wrong, but it went out of business. But <laughs> it was a way of thinking, and he hadn't quite got up to the world. Uh, dealt a little bit with Michael Dell, totally in the Steve Jobs category. <clears throat> Did not like him. Let me tell you another Steve Jobs story. So there's some years later when the Lisa computer was coming out. Lisa. And there was a big event, and I think it was the College Auditorium in the Bay Area, which is going to the Lisa. And Steve did his usual splashy demonstration, which I've been doing for quite a time. After the demonstration was over, they invited journalists to come up on the stage and do one on one with Steve. Well, what everybody was talking about at Silicon Valley is why does it have to be called the Lisa? And, the computer. and the word was Lisa was the name of the daughter. But so we never admitted to the printing. I thought it was pretty damn interesting. Everybody was talking about it. So everybody else was talking about the specs from Lisa, and I came up and said, Steve, we're going to ask a question. And everybody's asking me, what's the story and why it was called Lisa? That's not an appropriate question. Whoa, oh, geez. A lot of people are asking me about, get out and expect his fist at you. Security, get this guy out of here. Oh. That's the kind of guy I see John Really obnoxious punk. <laughs> Clever, brilliant, but not a nice man. Apple, let me say a word about Apple. Now, they're obviously a great company. They want to do wonderful products, great marketing, great design, et cetera, et cetera. But they are not a customer friendly company. Let me tell you my experience. Maybe some of you have the same experience. So I logged on one day to my computer and I said, Oh, why don't you upgrade from New Sunday to High Sierra? Much better experience. Yeah, sure, why not? Click, all of a sudden, New Sunday was gone and I had some High Sierra. What they didn't tell me, about $1,000 worth of software I have in the market. All my video software is a hit. Won't play under my steering. Apple stole $1,000 of worth of software from me. Brutally, without even warning me, this is what I'm having about upgrade. That was disgraceful behavior. This is not a company that cares about customers. It was furious about Anyhow, that's Jobs. And Apple. Uh, talked with Sergey Brin several times. A really nice guy, bright guy. Very impressed with the early days of Google. When Google was a startup working out of, I forget this woman's name, living in. They were a really good company. They didn't need a model of do no evil. They were in this evil. Always worried about a company needing a model of do no evil. I think that comes from the territory. But no, when Google went public and there were billions of dollars on the table, that company changed dramatically. Money, money, money. Uh, let's make a better life for people. Uh, very disappointed in what happened with Google. Of course, they changed the model. It's not do no evil to do the right thing. A more accessible. We had Steve Case on the show, a really nice guy. I got his AOL and before that quantum leak. Um, good man. Steve Wozniak is in the Gary category. Absolute gentleman. Adam Osborne was a guy I really respected. I don't know many people 
remember I'm on the way now with one of the first luggable computers in the city, the Osborne One. Uh, it couldn't compete with Compact when they came in with a similar machine. It then moved over to software and started sending out low cost software really clones of things like Lotus 123. He got sued by Lotus, got put out of business. He died a very sad life a couple of years after that. We had Jerry Yang on the show talking about when Yahoo first came out, good man. The most interesting odd couple I've ever seen in the tech business is Jack Tremiel and Gary Kilpaw. <laughs> Complete opposites. Gary was a, he was in, in, an inner thought kind of guy, techie guy. Jack Tremiel used to be, I think it was a sewing machine salesman. <laughs> he just knew retail and selling boxes. Gary had nothing about that. He knew nothing about technology. I don't think he had ever been to the Silicon Valley. And somehow these two guys got together with the new division of Active Ventures and Active Vision. And actually, Gary worked with Jack to do some of his multimedia products. Uh, really odd combination. Um, let me tell you one other interesting story. So we had many CEOs on the show who come into the studio to demonstrate their products. And what I, we wanted to get the top guy in the company, and that's the PR guy, so we often fought to get the CEOs. What happened almost every single time is a CEO would come in and he didn't know anything about the product. <laughs> he didn't know how to use it. Classic scene was there's a CEO on the set ready to do things. Like this. The little guy was on the video. F2, press F2. <laughs> 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 the kid's not. <laughs> I want to talk just a little bit about the Silicon Valley culture at that time because it's kind of a step for wise quality. When you talk to all these CEOs, we're going to make the world a better place, we're going to make it easier for you to do your job online, which was a step for life. Underneath, we're going to make a million dollars tax. The competitive culture in Silicon Valley was vicious, glossed over by this, oh, we're going to change the world and do good things for people and so on and so forth. It was a really tough time to accept some of this. Let me talk about why there is no more computer chronicles. So this was 2002, you remember that was the dot com bust. So for several years in the dot com boom, money was just pouring into the <coughs> dollar, for stupid ideas that had no chance of ever making. People got burned and a lot of money was lost, and it was hard to raise money in the valley. So, one problem was the dot com bust and people losing faith in new technologies. Second thing is the computer business has changed radically over 20 years. Our ace in the hole was we said to sponsors, everybody who watches our show is a customer. They're looking, you told, what's cool, what should I buy? 20 years later, everybody had a customer. So the game we were playing introducing people to this whole idea wasn't the same anymore. Matter of fact, I had an interesting conversation. I don't remember his name. The guy at the time was the editor of Macworld Magazine. He said, Stu, he said, when computers become like refrigerators, you just open them and close them and go down the business. And he was right. People didn't need as much the kind of stuff we were doing. The other thing that happened was, quite frankly, it was a very dull period starting in the early 2000s. Uh, Microsoft kind of owned the software world. IBM at the time sort of owned the hardware world. Startups had been just put out of business by these two big monsters. And it really wasn't as interesting as it had been before. We were having a little bit of struggle coming up with really cool new stuff. So there was a lull in innovation. There were lots of mergers and acquisitions, which made things less competitive. And Frank and I had been doing this over 20 years, 52 weeks a year. I was tired. I needed a break. So let's rethink this. Let's pull the show off the air for a while. So hard to raise the money, it was so hard to do what we'd done before. And I had a day job still. It was on TV today. Uh, so we decided to pull it off and see what happened. And not much happened. Um, let me tell you what happened next. So after taking down Chronicles, I was actually pretty impressed with what we'd done with the Internet Archive. We digitized all of the Chronicles service. That was a major move at the time, for certainly for the archive, certainly for us. And actually, Bruce McHale called me when he heard I wasn't doing the show anymore. He said, what you did with us for Computer Chronicles, could you do the same thing and manage our getting other video collections like yours? Because what you did was so successful. I said, sounds like a great challenge. So I actually went to work with the nonprofit Internet Archive for a couple of years, helping them build their collection from again, text, audio, and video. And now it's a gigantic collection. God knows how many other things. Let me tell you one really, two sad stories about my work at the Nintendo Archive. We had started something at the Archive called, terrible name, Open Source Video. <laughs> totally geeky, lousy user, user interface, terrible front end, but the idea was brilliant. 
And now bandwidth has become less expensive, storage was less expensive. We said, we will host your videos, whatever they are, upload them, and we'll carry them for you. Brilliant idea. And it was very successful. It was too successful. In the context we were in in this nonprofit, I, I get, kept going to our management team saying, we've got to do something higher, this idea of hosting for free user generated videos. And so, how are you going to make money showing videos of cats playing the piano? <laughs> trust me, I said. <laughs> they didn't trust me. Um, what happened next was very sad. So they didn't want to invest any money in making open source video better. A couple other guys did have the idea of stealing our idea and making it better, and they started something called YouTube. Mm -hmm. San Mateo, California, right down the street from us. In fact, when they were about to start YouTube, the guys from YouTube called me and said, look, we've got the great user interface, we've got the great platform, we've got the front end. You've got the content, we don't have any content. We work together, use your content, use our content. Great idea. We've got the next five on that. So what happened next? A couple of months later, YouTube launched. The biggest thing that's ever happened. A couple of months later, they sold YouTube to Google for $1.6 billion. Oh, we really blew it. People wouldn't believe it. Anyhow, the next really interesting experience I had in the Internet Archive <clears throat> it was a similar problem to what I had with computer chronicles. It turned out, I found out that NASA was really interested in doing what we had done by putting, creating a website with all video. NASA owned, as I owned the history of the personal computer revolution, NASA owned the video of the American Space Program 50 years ago. As is my problem, they had tapes sitting on shelves, in some cases films sitting on shelves rotting away. Nobody had access to this valuable stuff. Finally, they woke up at NASA one day and said, we've got to solve this problem. So they put out an RFP request for a proposal to somebody to come along and say, can you build a website for us? We will archive all our videos. <coughs> well, I was crazy enough to bid on this. I actually wrote the proposal up against lots of big companies. They're small nonprofits. And believe it or not, NASA picked us to do this. So we were doing exactly the same thing. We've done the same thing before. So excited. I mean, worked that, I think a year or two I spent working with NASA, the smartest people I'd ever come across. The nicest people. So we made the deal with NASA, but as what happened with the YouTube disaster, I could not convince management of the archive that this was worth investigating. We, NASA had never picked an outside vendor to do something like this before. We were the first ones. They couldn't figure out how they were going to make money on this. <clears throat> and I was not able to deliver on the promises I had made to NASA about how we were going to do this. And so they basically pulled the plug on it, and I quit the Internet Archive at the time because I was just too embarrassed that I had any promises I couldn't keep. But I had a second play in mind. NASA archives are supposed to focus exclusively on NASA content. I said, let's go beyond that. That's not the only space program in the world. There's the Russian space program, there's a Japanese program, there's a European space program. So I went to work with a company in Boston called Image Fortress, which is doing things very similar to what we're doing. And I said, let's build a site called the International Space Archive. This is a for profit company. Great idea, great fun. I had never known what the pressures of a startup were pressure for me to bring money in, to do things that I didn't think were ethical to do, just to bring money in. I, I wasn't comfortable doing it. So I quit that too because my reputation was worth more than whatever was going to happen in the company. So that was a sad story also. Actually being so frustrated with my experience with for-profit startups, I totally dropped out and went to academia and became a professor of broadcast journalism at the University of Nevada's Reynolds School of Journalism, which was great fun. And that's really basically, since then, I did that for a couple of years, but I couldn't afford to really do that much longer. The pay is terrible for university professors, mm -hmm. or at my level, anyhow. So since then, I've been doing freelance production, a little bit in the tech field, but really I've been very interested in technology in the healthcare field, and the personal experiences myself, which got me interested in that. Uh, and sort of brought that over as I did a special for PBS on the music for the piano. I did a five-part special for the Fox Business Network on um, palm oil, which is a long story I'm not trying to get into. People are always telling me, why didn't you relaunch Computer Chronicles? You just have to accept the fact that the world has changed. I mean, every guy with an iPhone in a basement can do some version of Computer Chronicles these days. I just didn't want to go through it all. And like, our show was an expensive show to do. Of course, it's a million bucks to do the show. And I just didn't have the stomach to run around with my hand out saying I needed a device to like the show again. The world had changed too much. So every, every week, there's some new thing that came out. Oh, I was only doing a show this week. I'd love to cover that too. So I didn't get to do that, and I just wanted to get, get tired of fighting the money battle. 
Um, so I'm back to being a tech geek, consumer. Um, very interested in things like virtual reality, artificial intelligence, self-driving cars, um, the Internet of Things, like having a mobile voice, fascinating thing, how we found things like Alexa and Google Assistant and Siri and Android. I mean, we did shows on speech for years. They never worked until about two years ago. <laughs> uh, I'm really focused on privacy issues on the web. I'm really upset with what's going on and what people like Facebook are making money on material that I've given for nothing. What a great business it is. Except my plus is zero. We basically charge people for using my content. I'm just upset that commercialization of the web, as many early web founders are, trying to be nuts when I click on seeing something. I can't see it. I've got to watch it. Yeah. It drives me nuts. So my current passion <laughs> idea is to start something I call the PBS of the internet. Quiet peaceful, non-commercial place where you can surf the web, do what you want to do, and get out of there without being bombarded. And, and, and. I don't know where that will kick off, but that's what I'm trying to do. Even though we put all the archive stuff, the computer chronicle shows and Netcafe shows online, they actually are all copyrighted, and we still are in the business of licensing them. We worked with CNN for a couple of years, they did a tech show in the 80s, the 90s, they licensed a lot of our material. Every day I get calls from people around the world who are doing documentaries or feature films looking for this video, which basically nobody else has. So we do a little bit of that. I actually worked on an interesting project, especially for me, the Steve Jobs Opera, which came in about a year ago, the San Jose Opera. And I spent a lot of time researching Jobs and Apple at the time after they died, of course. And uh, I learned a lot, but I didn't know about Apple. Didn't change my opinion. <laughs> but it was really interesting. I mean, Jobs was such an interesting character. I mean, Apple was such a, for a while, screwed up company, which obviously came back from the dead and it was only about business at some point. It was really interesting working with that. I actually put together a computer conference around the premium of the opera, talking about Apple and Steve Jobs. I actually wrote a book called Darwin's Dilemma. I've always been fascinated by interspecies communication. I've done some research for Coco the Gorilla, who did sign language. I wrote a book about that, which I'm still trying to publish. I've talked to some of you about, everybody's asking me, why don't you do a book about the inside story of the Chronicles. The good news is, I have all the notes, all the documentation from every show we've ever Bad news is, it's going to take hundreds of hours of work to turn this into a book. I'm trying to get going on that. My passion at the moment is Gary Kilmer and the plague of that. I mean, this story has to be told. It's such a great story. It's got a sad story. Meaningful story about so many messages in there. We got the play finished, we're ready to go. We decided not to do it as a play because it's really hard to raise money for something that vanishes after a couple of weeks. So we're working on getting money to do a feature film or TV special. It's called The Forgotten Computer Genius. It would be a title. And that's what I'm trying to get done right now. In terms of communicating and publishing and journalism, basically it's my Twitter account. I tweet every now and then with weird tech stories, and that is my continuing attempt to say something of value to people. That's about it, so thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found it interesting. Certainly not up to speed on all this stuff. Do you have a, a, a 
that kind of book do you recommend? That's a really good question. No, I don't. I have to think about that. Sorry. Right one. No, uh, believe me. All I need is time. <laughs> yes. Uh, did you see the series Halt and Catch Fire? Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, not just a bit of it. I didn't really see all of it. I'm sorry. I was trying to, in fact, sort of pull myself out of this whole tech thing for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of buried it in for 20 years, and so I expanded the healthcare and other things. I just put the fresh in mind. Yes? So, what do you think of the uh, new Apple Watch and its heart monitoring? <laughs> 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 as much as I hate Apple, I love Apple. <laughs> Uh, I like it a lot. I'm a big Apple Watch fan. This is actually the original. It's not the new one. I'm going to get the new one soon. Uh, a lot of people think it's a waste of time, a waste of money. I think it's pretty cool. I think what you can do on your wrist without grabbing things out of your pocket. Uh, it's very impressive. It's the best watch I've seen that does all this stuff. And I started out with other ones before Apple came out with the Apple Watch. Uh, it doesn't bother me about all this harm. I think the health stuff is really a good step in the right direction. There's so much of your information being stolen and used right now. That's the least of my problems. It just cracks me up when I see that watch. I think it sounds a little bit crazy. Yep. Yep. Same thing. Same thing. No, I think it's a very, very cool tool. They did a really good job. And again, I resisted for a while because they didn't want to resist anything until I give in. <laughs> well, that's what the best one out there. Yes? Uh, what's your favorite episode of the Oh, boy. Probably the very first one we ever did, because I was so proud that I actually pulled this off. Nobody thought we were going to do this. It was called From Mainframes to Minis to Micros. Mm -hmm. We actually went out to MIT and looked at what they were doing with mainframe computers and some incredible stuff. And just the fact that we pulled this off and did a show, I was able to pull it off. At the time, I think, I don't think Gary had co hosted it yet. I think it was using Herb Lechner from SRI, I think was the co host of that first show. You know, the really brilliant guy. We had actually gone to SRI. <clears throat> that didn't work out. They were very big friends of the show. Uh, just the fact that we pulled it off and did the show. We had some, in the early days, interesting times because we finally migrated to having more sort of product company oriented people. And the show, show started to be a lot of academics. But the very first season, not too long after we did that, like the Anthony Michael's Mini show, we did a show on artificial intelligence way back 30 years ago. And we had Ed Feigenbaum, the professor of artificial intelligence at Stanford, on the show. Ed was used to lecturing for 15 minutes. I didn't realize this was a TV show. We started out asking him one question. 45 minutes later, he's still talking. <laughs> Ed, you can't do this. So that's certainly but not my favorite show, one of my least favorite shows. <laughs> yeah. In your watch collection, do you have any of the early talking watches? I do. I have a box full of these watches. I mean, every gadget you could. I have the first MP3 watch. There's a video watch, and I got a lot. I was just fascinated by how you squeeze that technology onto your wrist. And uh, yeah, I, I bought everyone at the time. But it's pretty much done. Yeah. Yes? What are your thoughts on uh, why Andy Radio Chat lost the lead? Well, that's a complicated question. I think it's a couple of things. He got stuck selling in stores where people didn't know what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. So, in my experience, when I went shopping in the <laughs> Um, they really weren't, it wasn't a Silicon Valley company, I think they were really in tune with the culture of what was happening at the time. It was not that well a managed company, again, it was really a retail store that was trying to become a retail company. They just made a lot of mistakes and they were outplayed by the bigger players, uh, which is a shame. I mean, obviously, as we talked about, there's some very innovative things. Um, and it was sad, I mean, I've told somebody before, I mean, I still drive by the original Radio Shack store I went to when I bought my. Model one, and it's sad. It's not a good store. Yeah. Following on to that, I mean, do you think Candy's do you think Candy's origins played a big difference in it? I mean, it seems like they really got squeezed and, and they couldn't make what they were used to making anymore. Exactly. They were used to selling little gadgets with big margins. I mean, the competitive world they couldn't get away with that with the computers. I think mean, that's really a factor. And they just they didn't run the business well. I mean, they had some cool technology, obviously, but uh, they weren't prepared for the they got. Out. Especially when all the other guys came into the business. And even things like, uh, what do they call it? Um, it was a big change from uh, Computer Land. Computer Land. I don't know what radio shop was. 
Okay, thank you all again very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Unfortunately, Stuart, you're only going to be able to be around with us till about noon. So uh, stop by and say hi before he takes off here. Uh, the next speak speaker will be Arthur Gleckler on um, one kid's weird journey in the software, and that's at one o'clock.